Welcome to the Business Leader Spotlight. The Business Leader Spotlight is bringing attention to those in our community making a difference in business. It is also an opportunity to identify the skills they have learned and applied to get where they are. And now, let us go into this week's interview. Welcome to this week's edition of the Business Leader Spotlight. I'm your host, Michael Butler, and today we'll be going back over some of the nuggets, some of the information that I took away from my interview with Mark Horseman of Manager Tools. I enjoyed last week so much that I wanted to do it again, so I hopefully you'll enjoy this as well. Now, in, my, in reviewing the video with Mark, I found several different things that he shared, and there's so much great information that he shared with us in that hour, roughly an hour-long video. He talked about managerial behaviors, 80-20 uh, of uh, managerial behaviors, managers' responsibilities, remote management, Zoom calls, and much more. This week, I wanted to focus on uh, one topic primarily, and that's... Uh, when he talked about the responsibilities of manager and he said results and retention. Now I'm going to twist the title a little bit and give it my own little spin and talk about it as the responsibilities of leadership, because I believe that as a leader, those are our two primary indicators of our success or our failure, whether that, and that is results and relationships. Now, when I look at the two, I, I, I'm going to break them up slightly, but I'm going to talk about them together for a short mind if you don't mind. A short time if you don't mind. I'm going to look at them and turn them around and look at them slightly different because I think how you perceive a problem is often how you solve a problem. So I try to look at a problem from a different perspective to provide another perspective or another way to be able to solve a problem. So when we get to the to a certain point in our lives, uh, after that childhood stage, we get into high school uh, and somewhat into adulthood, our lives seem to be shifted into looking at what it is that uh, the things that we create and the way we made people feel as a value or, or a determining factor on our lives. So if we're good in school and then we you know, get into a good college or, you know, we get a good job or we get a job and people tell us that we're a good worker. People start focusing on, hey, you know, they're they're good at this or they, we begin to get those types of labels of, oh, so-and-so is good at uh, working with their hands. So-and-so is smart, all of those different types of things. And I'm not saying this is right, wrong, good, bad, and different. You know, it, it's just one way that people's people are perceived but i'm going to take a quote by zig ziglar and he said you can have everything in your in life you want if you will just help other people get what they want to me that's the summation of results and retention so if i'm willing to make relationships my highest priority the results will speak for themselves so basically retaining good relationships will provide me the opportunity, the avenue to produce the results that I want in my life. I'm not going to sit here and try to talk to you about building relationships because there are plenty of good books. There's plenty of good teaching on building relationships, how you can win, how you can influence friends or how to influence friends. I've said that wrong twice how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie or winning with people by John Maxwell. All of these are great books. They can show you because I'm not going to sit here and try to teach you when I still have my struggles with m developing and creating relationships. But I want to look at result, um, excuse me, retention or retaining relationships as the first piece. And I'm going to compare it with a bus driver versus a tour guide. Now, I grew up and I rode the bus to school from basically second, third grade all the way through my high school years. I rode the bus. 
And yes, in the eighth grade, I got to wear the cool little safety belt and was, you know, safety patrol guy or whatever you want. It was a very corny thing, but I was cool because I had the orange belt and, you know, provided safety for the younger students and things like that. But getting back on topic, uh, bus drivers, their jobs are relatively simple. They, they go a specific route, uh, pick up passengers along the way, and get them from point A to point B. They have some very specific skills. They, they, they keep passengers so safe. I'll say they have good communication skills of, of just saying, okay, here's where we're going, here's, here's where we're not going, here's what we're going to do. Uh, they have some patience with passengers, you know, getting them on the bus, you know, making sure that they can find a place to sit and things like that. But usually that's the extent of the interaction with a bus driver. Their job is to get you from point A to point B. No other questions, no other concerns. However, a tour guide is somebody that's a little bit different. It's like they're going on the journey. They, they're they sitting there with you going on the journey. They're some of the things that differentiates them is, is that they're organized. If they're a good tour guide, they're sensitive to the needs of the group. They understand when to allow the group to, to function and, and learn and, and talk at the same time, providing valuable information along the way. They're engaging. They don't just sit back and, and read the script, so to speak, and just say, okay, in 1886, this wall was built. In 1888, this wall was destroyed. It, it's not robotic. It It's engaging. It, it brings you into the story of what happens or what's going on where you're going. Now, I'm going to talk about a time when I went to the Biltmore Estates in Asheville, North Carolina. Now, if you've never been, this is this place is mind blowing boggling just the sheer size it's an 8,000 acre estate and their home is a four-story building with 235 rooms you look at it and you're in awe because you see the craft the craftsmanship of it the architecture you know the works of art hung throughout the home all those different types of things and just the the amount of work that that went in to make that place you know as I was going through, you know, you're walking through, you're taking pictures, and it's beautiful, it's nice, but along the way, I noticed people that had little headsets on, and these headsets basically were the uh, the voice of somebody kind of explaining to them what was happening or, or what went on in the room and, and the different features and the different details of the room. Now, these people had paid a little bit of extra money to have a tour guide with them. Now they were a part of a group that the tour guide would get on their headset and, you know, get in and speak into the microphone and it would go into their ears so that the external noises from the people wouldn't drown out the conversation and the explanation of, of what they were seeing and what they were hearing. Now in my time, I, I previously thought that was, a waste of money and a waste of time because I can learn all of the things I needed to learn by just, you know, going in, looking, taking a few pictures. Hey, this is cool. This is great. Yada, yada. I'm ha- I've had a good time now. Now move on to the next thing. I'm going to sh- share with the fact that as I went through the tour of the Biltmore Estates, I wanted to find out more about some of the history, some of the different pieces. And and I wasn't able to, you know, easily get that information. I was able to find it, but I had to ask questions, had to ask some of the people that worked there to to get a little bit more detail on the specific use of rooms and the specific, you know, occurrences uh, during those times when the, the estates were built. And looking back, I, I didn't realize the benefit of a tour guide until I went to the John Maxwell team's international uh, certification. When I went to Orlando, I was new. I was by myself. I didn't know very many people. Actually, I didn't know anybody. Uh, so I, I go there you know, by myself. I don't know many people. And, 
you, you feel kind of like an outsider because you see people know each other and people talking and things like that. So I went and during the time I got to meet some of the uh, JMT uh, mentorship faculty and, and, and just in brief conversations with them, they were able to to talk with me about my journey from being a new JMT member to becoming a JMT member. When I say JMT, I mean John Maxwell team member to being an insider, somebody that's a part of the family, so to speak. And there's one specific experience that I, I, I want to share that really kind of closed the deal for me. I was speaking with uh, the CEO of the John Maxwell companies, Mark Cole. And I was, you know, I just came up, wanted to talk with him, ask him a few questions about leadership and, and being a part of the John Maxwell team. And right before I asked my questions to him, his wife comes up to him and says, oh, you've got five minutes. So he had to be somewhere in a very short period of time. And I was going to tell and I told him and I said, Mark, you know, if you have to go, I understand, you know, you know, you have a schedule to keep so on and so forth. And he said, you know, don't worry about it. I've got time. And he basically, he said, what's your question? And my question was, is what would you recommend for someone who's starting out in JMT? Uh, he gave me a very uh, simple response. He said, get into the community and find a lane that speaks to me and let, and ride that train and don't get off. Now that may mean nothing to uh, most of you, but for me that, I understood that to mean that if you're going in a specific direction, if you're going down a specific path, get on the train and find the people that are going to be able to help you identify some of the different landmarks, some of the different features of the terrain that you're going to be facing. Because without having somebody to be able to point out those specific, uh, landmarks, some of those specific ter terrain changes, I'll say, whether it goes from a flat land to, to mountainous, a map may give you some definition, but that map doesn't give you that real explanation of what changes on the territory. It, it can be a very, you know, low plain to a slight mountainous incline to basically, you know, a sheer cliff. So, having somebody there to explain to you what's going to happen next. And that's what I mean by the difference between a tour guide and a bus driver, somebody that can be there with you and allow you to experience the journey and, and get from it what you need. But at the same time, know at specific points when to add a little bit of piece of history, a little bit of detail that, that provides an insight and it provides an understanding that you wouldn't have without that. The other piece I wanted to talk about uh, in regard to that is uh, the the results piece. I'm going to use the 80-20 principle or Pareto's principle, however you want to say it, it in talking about how 20% of your activities will provide you 80% of your results. Now, again, I'm going to talk about this one a little bit differently and use myself as a guinea pig because for a lot of years, I focused on this principle backwards. And I thought, oh, if I focus on the 80%, the other 20% won't matter. I had a poor understanding of what Pareto's principle was. So when I created my tasks lists, I would create very long lists, say 10 items, and I'd have eight easy items on there. I would go through and knock out the eight easy items thinking I was building momentum for myself. And instead, I was kind of, I was slowing myself down and keeping myself from doing those things that would provide me great value and, and great greater impact. Now, one time... Uh, I can remember I, I was in uh, network engineering and I, I worked for the government for a while. During my time, uh, we uh, were rolling out some software to the whole uh, air station. Excuse me. 
And as we were rolling out uh, the software, uh, one of the government employees said, you know, focus on the 80%, focus on the 80%, you know, 80, 20. And my thought was, okay, well, if we get 80% of the machines, then, you know, the other 20% we can handle on a as needed case by case basis. And which to some degree, I, I understand the, the perspective, but where I, I failed in that was I looked at, okay, well, how do I get this out? How do I roll out this software? How do I make this software go out in the easiest way possible? Not necessarily the most effective way. I was looking for efficiency versus effectiveness. So if I can efficiently say, okay, take a, a software image and distribute it, oh, 80%, that's done. Now, there, that has two sides to it. One is, well, you're using leverage because, you know, it's automated. You don't have to do anything. The other side of that is it's automated and you don't have to do anything. There's a lot more risk involved with that. Now, in that instance, I spent most of my time trying to deal with the 80%, not looking at, okay, well, how can I leverage this so that this is a a tool, a process that we can do on a repeated basis now over time in my my job there that we, we got to that point. But in the, some of the first iterations of it, it was, it was this whole slow process, this clunky process of trying to get software rolled out. We didn't have the right machines in place in, in order to do testing. We didn't have the right, uh, basically tools in place in order to roll the software out on an automated basis. It, there were a lot of little, uh, hiccups in the road that, that we did learn along the way. Now, by the end of my time there, we did get the process to where it was, okay, we, we focused on 20% of the effort and it got us 80% of the results, meaning we had the right machines to, in order to test with, we had the right tools in order to create the software packages in order for them to be released. All of those little things came over time, but I wanted to share is that my thinking incorrectly had me looking at, okay, well, how do I do the 80%? And the 80% is important. Let me not, let, let me not, you know, say, oh, well, it, it, it just needs to be forgotten about. No, the 80% is important in the fact that, okay, what leads to that 80%, finding those key 20% things. Now, now that's where the challenge become, comes in. And it is an iterative process, meaning we have to go over, okay, hey, I'm, I'm going to start this. You know, if I leave this undone, what kind of result do I get? If I leave that undone, what kind of result do I get? And, and finding out that right mix of things. So I don't want to go into an explanation and a teaching on the 80-20 rule. That's, that's not, I'm there, again, there's videos out there for that. There's plenty of, there's a really good book by 8020 principle by Richard Koch. Uh, it's a great book. I re highly recommend it. At the same time, I want to just focus on the importance of finding, okay, what is it that I'm doing? What are the results that I want in my life? Identifying those. Okay. What are the relationships that I need. Okay. Who, who do I need in my life? Who, who are the people that are in my life that I can help achieve their results? Who am I the lever for, so to speak? I think Archimedes said it. If you give me a lever long enough, I can move the whole world. You know, in, in, in the case of me, who am I the lever for in order to move their world to help them get, achieve that thing. And then by action of helping somebody else achieve their goals, what is it that you're going to begin achieving? What are the things that are going to be coming across your path in order to achieve those? So that's one thing to think about with the 80-20 uh, principle or Pareto's principle. The other piece that I, I want to think about is, is or talk about 
is being able to apply 80-20 questioning or Pareto principle style questioning. Now, that's a it's a completely different thought process because we go from thinking about, okay, well, we're taught, oh, you've got all of these things to do. Now you've got to get them all done. And, and we think that, well, if we just work harder, we're going to be able to get more done. At a certain point, there's not enough hard work in a day that can get things done. Yes, delegation is something that, that if you're in a position and you have people that you can delegate to, that's great. But we still come to those points in times. I know I turn off my computer, I turn the lights off for the evening, and I still have work to do. No matter how much I can delegate, you know, whether that was in previous careers, in my time in the military, wherever, I've always left the the office and there was more work to be done. So that it's not a question of uh, enough time in the day. It's an, It's, okay, what am I putting in the time? So what kind of effort am I putting in the right types of effort throughout the day? And that's where one of the issues I had with the 80-20 is that I was looking at, okay, well, what are the things that are easy that I can get off my task list? In my head, I was thinking I was building momentum. And in some ways I was, but I was building momentum in the wrong things. I would get, oh, well, I can send this email to so-and-so. Oh, I can go over to talk to somebody about, you know, a piece of software or making an update instead of looking at the things that were going to provide value for the organization as a whole. And being able to identify those things that are high value pieces. And the biggest one that I've come to find is the highest value that I've come to find is in is with people, is be, being able to retain relationships with people. Now, it's not always easiest and it's not always the most comfortable that I've come to see, but taking that time and working with people and applying the right types of questions to that process it, it, of, okay, how do I how do I help this person? How do I work with this person? How do I help this person get what they want? And a lot of that goes into, okay, the right questions. What are the prime, you know, asking questions like what are the primary constraints to, to what you're facing right now? You know, what's the biggest obstacle to moving forward? And when you get to the questions like that, well, what's the biggest obstacle to moving forward? The next one in my mind is what can I do right now? Because I've told, I've said in the past, oh, I can't do X because of Y. Well, I can't, be, I can't start my own business because I don't have the background. But what can I do right now? You know, for me, that was getting started with uh, getting certified with the John Maxwell team. You know, going through that process, making that investment in myself, then. Once I did that, what was the next step? Okay, what can I do right now? Well, I can develop myself. I can learn the materials. You know, being a leadership expert, expert and recognized with the certification from the John Maxwell team took that to a whole nother level. And and continuing that process and, and just saying, okay, well, what, what's the next step in the process? Now, it may sound like I'm t going against what the 8020 is talking about, I'm not in the fact that you're finding that 20% of things of, okay, what can I do now that's going to provide me the leverage I need over here and being able to consistently do that. And then as you get more equipped with the process, you'll get better at it and you'll be able to see more quickly and more, I'll say readily, what are the 20% the of things that you need to be able to do and begin to work on uh, for what's next? Then the next one that the next line of questioning uh, or next question to come along, I would say is, what if I remove this obstacle? So previous question is, is what is the biggest obstacle to moving forward and, and what can I do now? So thinking through, OK, what if I remove this obstacle? What's going to happen? What are the unintended consequences of this action? 
And it's easy to say, oh, there are none. There are always unintended consequences. And people will always have a way to to respond and reply to things. It's not to put you into a, a mode of fear of, oh, no, I can't do this because this will happen. No, it's to get you to think through, okay, what are some of the different outcomes of this? Okay, if I do this, what does that mean over here? So if I get certified with it, or if I go down the road to get certified with the John Maxwell team, oh, that's going to cost me money. What type of investment is that going to be? Where am I going to get the money? All of those different types of questions. Okay, now once I have this certification, what am I going to do with it? Am I just going to sit on it or am I going to use the tools? And then a sub question to that is, is does it create any new problems? Again, that's just thinking through, okay, w what's out there? Will it create a new problem along the path? Once you identify and you think through that, what doesn't this solve? So asking yourself that question, okay, well, if I remove this obstacle that's in my way, well, I want to start my own business and going down the job, going down and, and getting certified with the John Maxwell team is my first step asking myself the question, what doesn't this solve? This doesn't solve the immediate problem. This doesn't solve, you know, putting food on the table, putting money in my bank account, any of those types of things. But it does get me to think about, okay, what are the pieces of this that I'm not focused on? And expanding my mind to be able to see more and to be able to understand more about what it is that I want to be able to do and what it is and how I can go about getting it done and, and using a tool like Pareto's principle as a way to help me get there, but not just saying, oh, well, apply 80-20 to it, but to go through the questioning process, I, because I think the questioning process is the most important piece of it because it challenges you to ask the questions of yourself and it, and look inside of yourself to say, Okay, what is it that I need to be able to do? What is it I, that I should be doing here that I'm not? All of those different types of things. The other piece uh, that I wanted to share in closing is that don't be so hard on yourself. During my time, I've tried to apply Pareto's principle, and I've found myself going back to focusing on, you know, the 80 percent that I, oh, I got to do this. I got to do this. Oh, I got to respond to this email. Oh, I need to go check over here. I need to go check my LinkedIn profile. Oh, I need to go check this. Oh, my phone buzzed. I need to look at that. Who's calling me? And on and on and on and on. We go back, we go back into these things. We fall back into old patterns and old habits. Don't beat yourself up. Allow yourself time to grow into it and understand that it is a process of growth. And if you can do it, well, today you can do it well tomorrow and, and continuing down that path. So in closing, I wanted to provide just a couple of questions for you to to think about and to to really bring home some of the learning, some of the things that I shared today with you. And so for the questions under re responsibilities of leadership, we're talking about retention first. Who are the people in my life that I want to always have as a positive relationship? Who are the people in my life that I always want to have a positive relationship? Second question, who are the people in my life that I would like to have a new relationship with or a positive relationship? So people that I, who are the people in my life or who are the people that I want to have a positive relationship with or have a relationship with. Then finally, the last one is, how can I add value to them? How can I add value to their lives? So those people are the people that you want to maintain a positive relationship with, who you want to develop a positive, positive relationship with, and those who you may not have as positive of a relationship with at this point. Finding out how you can add value to those three different categories of people. Then under results, or Pareto's principle is, we're just going to go back to those questions that I talked about earlier. It's like, identify the primary constraint to what I'm facing right now. So how can I identify 
or what is the primary constraint that I'm facing right now? What is the primary constraint that I'm facing right now? What is the big op what is the biggest obstacle to me moving forward? The sub question of that are what can I do right now? What can I do right now? Last question is what if I remove the obstacle? What if I remove the obstacle? And then a couple of sub questions for you as well on this one is does it create any new problems? Does it create any new problems? And finally, what doesn't this solve? What doesn't this solve? So uh, glad you were able to take the time and share with me uh, responsibilities of leadership, uh, specifically in results and retention and going into developing our relationships and using the Pareto principle. So I want to say thank you for joining us this week on the Business Leader Spotlight. Thanks. Thank you for watching this week's video. I hope you were able to find one thing you can begin to apply to your life today. I would appreciate it if you would like, comment, and subscribe. Also, if you have any feedback, leave it in the comments below. Let us know if you know of any great guests to be on the spotlight. I look forward to your questions and your comments. Thanks again for watching.